Good to see everybody this morning. We are continuing in a study called When Love Comes to Town. And this week and next week, we're going to look at what happened. What happens when God, God's people end up in a secular city? What do they do? How do they look at that place? How do they view that place? And so that, we're going to take the second step um, today. And the reason is because it's focused on our vision for next year, which we're going to be looking around our city and saying where are those places where we can serve, how has God called us to live and be a part of the city. And so would you pray together with me? Let's pray. Father, we need you. We need your word, your truth. We need times of worship like this to help us see, to help us see that you're at work in our world, in, in our city, and also in, in each of our lives. For us to remember that you're the God who rules and reigns over all things, and in Christ, you're bringing your kingdom. And you're bringing it in us and, and in this city where we live. And so I pray, Father, you'll open our eyes, and reveal yourself to us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Do you love our city? I mean, this is my hometown. I was born here. Come on, you guys. Uh, I was born in Miami, and of course it was a different city when I was born because this city has grown so rapidly. I don't know if you know, but we take in about 600 new residents to the greater Miami area every week, every week. And it's down from 1,000 a week just a few years ago. And so the question, you know, do you love the city? I was reading the story about this pastor. His, you'll see a picture of him. His, his name is Tom Shirk. He's in uh, Boulder, Colorado, and he preached one Sunday on Jesus' parable of the talents. And then at the end of his sermon, he, what he did was he said, how many of you guys want to be on assignment from God in our city going forward from here? And a bunch of people raised their hand, and he went to each of them after the service and gave them each a crisp $100 bill. And he said, look, I want you to multiply this money, and then over the next three months, give it to something that you think God cares about. Within over, when in less than three months, over $50,000 had been given by those 110 people to plant, to help plant a new church in the community, to help support the tutoring of children, to assist in the settling of Sudanese refugees that had shown up in Boulder. And you're like, that's awesome. But the pastor wasn't done. A couple of months after that, he preached about how Jesus warned people about letting possessions own their heart and their lives. And he said, I want every one of you, if you'll commit to do this, to sell something that you treasure and to give the money away. And at their church, they held over 200 garage sales and they raised over $80,000 to give to needs at, at uh, you know, spiritual social service organizations there in their city. This amazing thing happened. Imagine 200 garage sales and all of the things people parted with and were able to then give those resources away. But he wasn't done then either. He went to the public schools there in Boulder and you could tell, I mean, if you see our public schools here, they, they're missing a coat of paint from like 10 years ago. And they went to three schools with hundreds of people and they painted, they scraped off pounds of gum from under desks. They even weighed up the number of pounds that they, that they scraped away, if you can imagine that. They cleaned out all their air ducts and, and then they sat down and they wrote 300 personal letters to thank the teachers and the staff members of those schools. And the folks who do the, you know, the extreme makeover heard about this and came out and did a film of it. And this wasn't a gimmick. The idea was for the congregation to get to know their city and to love their city and to find practical ways to serve, to join parent-teacher associations, to volunteer at the rescue mission, to foster a child, tutor a student, and to become a part of a new church plant in the area. So I read about this. I'm like, wow, God, do you have like a, a kingdom assignment for us? What do you have for us to do in our city? Now, I understand living in a city presents immense challenges. 
Perhaps the cost of living is impacting you. It has us through the years. Or it's the crowded roadways. I do not want to be on the palmetto in certain hours, right? I mean, that's when you learn how spiritual you are, right? Sort of where you, you stand spiritually. And there's this collision of values and, and lifestyles. In our world, for the first time in history, more people are living in the great cities than live in rural areas. And in many ways, this is the best time ever for our cities and also the worst time. I mean, arts and, and faith are coming to the cities and science. It's amazing the culture in this city. But then there's also the challenges of crime and the disparity in the way people live. You'll see pictures like this one in which you've got well over here and then extreme poverty across the street. We have some places like that in our county. It's overwhelming. Our, our county schools are struggling to pass along base, basic skills and competencies. There is life here, it's true, but there's also immense loneliness for people. There's ethnic division and competition. And by the way, during the pandemic, people have actually fled some of the great cities. Because now with technology, you can work just about anywhere. We've chosen isolation over community and, and self-protection over service. And what I find as I talk to people here in Miami is that I find a deep love for our city. And also I find this dislike for our city. Now as we get started, it might help to know why we have cities and what they promise and then how redemption comes to the city. Now, Scripture in the opening chapters of Genesis tells us about the establishing of the first city. Cain made love to his wife. She became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his own son, Enoch. Now, it may seem like a few words, but it's loaded with the story of Cain's life. And if you remember, he's the guy who killed his brother Abel. And because of that, he became a restless wanderer. And he didn't just do anything. He did something very specific. First, he had children. Because this was a way that he felt he could be life-giving, right? He could create life. And he showed his desire to transmit it through his kids, but he also built a city. And you say, why? Well, in his wandering, he needed a place of belonging and security, and so he substitutes, you could say, a place of his making for the place of God's making. And the reason we know that is because he named both his son and his city the same thing. He named it them Enoch, and that literally means something like dedication or initiation or it can even mean inauguration. So you can see Cain now cut off from God. He builds a city and begins to have children to create his own world. In a sense, his own Eden. And this is what we do in cities. They're for provision and protection and to build sort of a world of our own design and our own making. Now, we need to know that God loves cities. God doesn't hate cities. He loves anywhere where people are. But it's helpful for us to know, you know, what happens in this city? What is this all about? And it makes me want to ask, well, how are we to view our life in a city like this? And that's what I want to look at with you today from this prophecy given to Jeremiah. How does love come to town? Now today we open to one of the saddest parts of the scriptures in the history of the people of God. This is from about 600 years before Jesus was born. And it's a time when God's people are 800 miles from home. The two superpowers of the day were Babylon to the north and Egypt to the south. And, and little Judah, this small nation, was caught in the middle. And a time came when under King Nebuchadnezzar, the armies of Babylon showed up and laid waste all of Judah and destroyed Jerusalem. A part of that process was the deportion of God's people. And, and this city, by the way, Babylon, is not just any city. 
It was first built by a guy named Nimrod. You'll see a rendering of it. It was the cradle of plundering and conquering, and it grew to be one of the most glorious cities on earth. By the way, it was built by conquest and with the purpose of conquest. And it was filled with the glory of all the cultures. What they believed in doing was bringing all those cultures home to the, with them. But it was also filled with every vice at the same time. So here, arts and science and literature, everything. By the way, clothing fashion was actually born in this city called Babylon. It was rich and fruitful, but also decadent and evil. And now think about God's people. He said, you guys are to be holy. You're to be set apart. You're never to touch anything unclean. And now they're in a city where literally everything was unclean. And so what were they to do? How were they to live? Would they create their own neighborhood and barricade themselves away from the city and evil and bide their time? They had false prophets who showed up and they said, you know what, you're going home any day now. You know, we know this is a bad thing, but it's, it's going to be over next week. Don't, don't, you know, realize this is going to be over. And this is when the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And God asked Jeremiah to write a letter to these exiles and to tell them, you're going to be there a long time, for decades. Here's how this letter begins. This is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now I hear that and I want to say, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought it was Nebuchadnezzar, the, the king of Babylon, that destroyed Jerusalem and took the exiles away. But here God says, I carried you into exile. There's more to the story. He tells them that this is not a mistake of history, that you are where you are. This exile was planned by the Lord himself. God purposed them to live in a pagan and sinful city and then to leave them for a very long time. This was God's design. As you think about this, do you believe in the sovereignty of God? That beyond the events you see in your life, a sovereign God is at work. I was, re I was reminded very recently by, by something that happened in the news of a story that I had read a bunch of years ago and I shared with our Granada family. It's the story of this guy. His name is Richard Park. And um, he had been doing missionary work in Greece and he flew to the United States. And a day he got on a bus in Salt Lake City and he took the bus all the way to Washington, D.C. And while he was on the bus, he met his bus mate who rode beside him the whole trip, whose name was John. And along the way, these two men talked and this guy, Richard, he shared the gospel with a guy named John who was in the seat next to him. Here's what Richard said. He said, we got off the bus around noon on the 29th, that's of 1981, and then claimed our baggage and said our goodbyes, and these were my parting words. John, I believe God had a reason for us to meet. Next day, I was shocked and saddened as you were too to learn of the attempted assassination of President Reagan. Later that same afternoon, while looking at the TV screen, I noticed a still photograph of the alleged assassin. It was John W. Hinckley Jr., my seatmate, on the Greyhound bus. You see, there's a day when you realize, you know, God is working in the details of our lives. And wouldn't you know, John had an opportunity in the offering of the gospel given by God to go a different direction. Now, I shared that story seven years ago, and three days later, I got an email from this guy, Richard Park, because a friend of his had actually been in our worship service and heard that I had talked about him. And he reached out to me and told me the whole story of what happened. And what he said was this, this event changed his thinking. It changed his perspective. And so the question do we begin with is, you know, what is your perspective about where you are? 
Is it just circumstantial or do you believe God is working in the details? Here's William James. He said, when we see all things in God and refer all things to him, we read in common matters superior expressions of meaning. And so what Jeremiah says is, you know, you just think that this is where you've ended up, but God has a purpose in this. God is the one who ordained this, and that's why we live the way we do. We learn that we are living according to the sovereign design of God. And so is your presence here in Miami. Now, you may have moved here because you of family, or perhaps a company moved you here for a position, or maybe you're in college or graduate school, you're studying here. God has a purpose in you being here. And your purpose is a part of his plan. It is more divine appointment than it is coincidence. And you say, well, how so? Well, let me tell you, God took his people to Babylon for at least two reasons. First, they had wandered from him. And there's something about being in a city like this where you see this collision of lifestyles that you begin to think, okay, what really matters to me? How am I going to live? We see the outcomes of these ways of life. Think of what happens. You feel this dislocation, this disequilibrium. Sort of like, have you ever gone from like a jacuzzi right into a regular swimming pool? And you're like, whoa, (laughs) sort of takes your breath away. Imagine now the people of God moving into the city of Babylon. They're like, okay, we, we know why we believe what we do. And we realize in our lives the need for God. You see, it may be far away from home that you come to understand what home means. Far away from God that you know what you're missing. And it was there in Babylon that actually the faith of this people was cemented for hundreds of years to come. But there was a second reason. God called his people to be priests for the world, to show forth his glory and his purpose to the nation. That's what God told Abraham he was to be and all that followed him. But instead of sharing God's light, they they kept to themselves. I think of the story of Jonah. We're going to look at that next week and and how he sees the city. And here's this guy who's like the epitome of somebody walking with God. And God says, hey, I want you to go over to this pagan city and declare the opportunity for them to turn to me. And Jonah will have nothing of it. You see, the Jewish people had come to hate their neighbors and they shirked God's purpose and they were resting in their pride rather than becoming bearers of God's grace. And God often had to restore his people to their mission, to remind them of their calling in the world. So how are they gonna fulfill that mission? Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens, eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. So here's what God commands. Their mission is become a part of the city. Take up residence. When you plant a garden, you're going to be there for a while, right? Make a life there. Don't, Don't have one foot out the door. Buy in. Settle down. Become a stakeholder. Now, by the way, nothing could be more shocking than this. He doesn't say, hey, resist everything. Don't be a part of... No, he says, have your family there. Grow your family. Have children. I remember when Sandy and I moved out of Miami. We did so a couple of months after we got married. We looked at each other and thought, oh, we'll be back here soon. But we weren't. And I remember years later, we were in New Jersey. We looked at each other and thought... We, no, we wouldn't have believed anybody if they told us all of our kids were going to be born in New Jersey. I mean, you know, I mean, that just was not going to happen to us. But God has a purpose for us to settle where he calls us. That became home for us. We came to love the people and love this place. So that's our first calling on mission is settle down here. Become a part of the city. Now, I know what happens to us. A lot of times we think, oh, my life will begin at some time in the future. Maybe you've said, oh, my life will begin when I I graduate from school. Oh, no, my life will begin when I get married or or when I have kids. Or maybe when I I retire, I'm going to have time to serve. But God tells his people, become rooted 
where you are right now. Not sometime in the future. Do it today. Often people come to Miami, they will tell me they don't want to commit to serving because they're going to move out of Miami very soon. And this is what I tell them. Be here until you're not here. I mean, really be here. Commit to being here. And then stay as long as you can because you're needed in this city as a follower of Christ. See this as a mission from God because it is. This week I tell the story in my podcast of a missionary friend from years ago. He was called to go to Turkey and to work in an almost 100% Muslim community. And he said when he went, he knew that as soon as he got there, if he started to be open about his faith in Christ, he would probably be deported. And so when he moved into Turkey, what he did was he was like, okay, I'm going to be having to leave in a hurry. So he went and he got like a folding table and folding chairs and some simple wicker furniture and a little futon bed, you know. He got the most temporary stuff you could absolutely find because he knew he was going to leave it behind. And then he told me, he said, I'd been there seven years when, when I realized I, I could no longer live a temporary life. And you see, that's what we will do unless we trust the sovereignty of God and we're willing to be where he calls us and until he calls us somewhere else. You see, love to a city looks like proximity. It looks like being near people and committing to those people who are your neighbors. That's the way it works, to become a part of your city and commit to your neighborhood. And then he says this, and seek and seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now I read this and I think, God, okay, you've, you've said a lot here, but you've got to be kidding about this. These are the people, their country has just destroyed your country, and they have forcibly taken you on a couple month walk of almost 800 miles, and God says, now that you're in their city, Work for the prosperity of this city. Pray that there'll be a place of peace. You've got to be kidding me. They've destroyed their lives. Yet the Lord calls his people to seek their peace and their flourishing. And, and this sounds so much like the gospel, right? This is the calling that his people have to be, to be priests for the world, loving your enemies and doing good to those that would hurt you. This is so powerful. And, and so this is what we're called in the city of Miami. God wants his people to prosper. And this will happen when the pagan city has peace. So he says, pray for this, work for it to be so. And this is what the gospel is all about. It's about bringing peace with God that, that opens the door for us to have peace with each other. And it's revolutionary. You say, what, is, what would that look like in the city of Miami? Well, it would look like children being cared for because they're not getting proper schooling. Somebody is tutoring them in the afternoon. It would be somebody stepping up and say, wow, we, we'll foster a child in our home because we know there's so many children that are not growing up in a healthy home. It means caring about the elderly in our city. There's so many in our city and they're forgotten, right? But, they, but loving them. I heard this amazing story on This American Life. I love This American Life. About this man living in Nanking, China. Didn't know that much about Nanking. But there they have this giant bridge. You're seeing this guy. I don't know if you dim the lights up here. Maybe people can better see him on the right. Um, this guy there, they just call him Mr. Chen. Uh, there on that four-mile bridge that covers, goes over the Yangtze River, about one person at least every week commits suicide and jumps off the bridge. And they do this. And by the way, the government doesn't even try to keep count. And they do this because some are depressed, others are mentally ill, some have experienced tremendous failure and the only way out for them is to jump. And so this guy, Mr. Chen, recognized this. And he's like, you gotta do something about this. Do you see the binoculars around his neck? Here is what he does. When he is not working, he spends every hour he has, every extra hour, he's just watching the bridge from the South Tower. And when he sees somebody walking across and they're getting up on the rail, he gets on his scooter and he goes over there and he pulls them off the rail. 
And he gives them a good talking to. You would think he just puts his arm around them. And he says, oh, I'm so sorry. But he says, what in the world are you doing? Don't take your life. You know, it's very powerful what he does because they're going to jump. Thus far, he has served, saved 321 people who are ready to jump off that bridge. And when I thought of his story, I thought of this. You know what he said? He said his nightmare is seeing a person ready to jump and not being able to get there fast enough. That's what he says. When I thought of his story, I thought about our Savior and how he stands so ready to save. He doesn't want one single person to be lost. I mean, I think that's what Jesus came to do. He came to the earthly city, to the earthly Babylon to bring peace. You know, at the end of his life, he could have stayed away from Jerusalem. But he set his face toward it out of love for it. And the day that he arrived on the triumphal entry, this is what we're told. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you there's that word, right? Peace, wholeness, shalom. But now it's hidden from your eyes. You see, the rejected one brought them peace. He could see the hardship and destruction in their future. And that week, Jesus was arrested. He was put through a mockery of a trial. He was led out to the cross for, to his death. And he came not only to rescue us, he was willing to lay down his life for us. And you know this, where did they take him? They took him outside the city is where the cross was. You see, Jesus died on a cross outside the city. He was rejected from the earthly city so that you might be welcomed into the city of God. So that you might bring peace to the city where God has called you to live. Isn't that beautiful? This week and next week and next year, we're going to be learning about ways in which we can do this in our city. But it really begins with us having peace with God. It's then that our hearts and minds, are, we, things can be reoriented to serving God. You see, this isn't a call to shape up. This is not that call. It's a call that comes when we wake up. When we've been loved by God so much that we wake up to the needs of the city that we're living in and the opportunities that God has put right in front of us. Now, there's a verse in, this, in, this, in our reading today that's a favorite of so many people. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Now let me tell you, this verse in context would hardly be a favorite verse. They were written by God to his people when they were far from home. They do not want to be there in a pagan city. They are facing the challenges of living there, making a life there. And he says, but that's where I'm going to give you your future. That's where you have a hope. And he says, actually, that's where when you seek me, I'm going to be found by you. When you seek me with all your heart. It's there in that place on mission in the earthly city. And so I ask as I come to the end of this, you know, where, where is God pushing you? Where is God giving you eyes to see? And maybe it begins by, by doing that. Just say, God in prayer, help me to see the people who are around me. Teach me what it means to love the people who are around me in the city. Maybe it means repenting about over complaining about the city and doing something to bring peace where we live in the city. So I'm going to invite you. We have some kingdom assignments this year. Uh, Crystal shared about how we're getting the word out to our neighbors. That really is not just a job for her, but for all of us to connect with our neighbors. Also, our deacons are planning to, uh, to do a habitat build. They're going to build a, a home in the city of Miami this year for a family that's never had a home of their own. And hopefully you'll be hearing about you, how you can participate with them in that. We're planning a compassion day when we go out into the city and find ways, practical ways we can serve our city. Next week, our Thanksgiving offering is all to be given for another replant of a church, the church in Pem Pembroke Pines. So if you're here next week, you can engage with that. I'd encourage you to do so. So you know, where, how is God calling you to surrender to this moment in your life? Father, thank you for sending us Jesus, for sending us Jesus into our city 
into our world. Father, we know, um, we know the challenges and the joys of living in this city. I pray that you would give us a love that comes from you because we ourselves have been rescued by Jesus. We have love for other people around us because we've been so loved by you and him. And Father, thank you for the cross that stands as a monument to what Jesus, what you as our God, are willing to do for the salvation, for the life, for the peace of a city. And so today here in our worship, Lord, we pray for peace in this city. We pray for peace in not only the removal of strife, but between people in our neighborhoods. We pray for the peace that comes from having a job that instills a person with dignity, having a home to return to in the day, having a school that's a healthy place to be in and a safe place. Father, we pray for the peace, the peace that comes when people come to know you. And we ask for wisdom in how to share your peace where you've called us to live. And we thank you and pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.